Let's get started. Robert Lechty is a passionate Python coder, open sorcerer, Postgres fanboy, opinion haver, and peanut butter enthusiast. Today, Robert will be building on Brett Victor's famous inventing on principle presentation, looking at how we can instantly run and visualize our Python code after every keystroke. Please welcome Robert Lechty. Okay, hi folks. So I'm Rob and uh, my current obsession is more humanistic software development. Um, in this session, as the title suggests, we're gonna be looking at instant feedback, instant debugging Python coding, and uh, to get straight into it, here's how it works. So the general idea is that every time you change the code, the code gets run. And by the time your fingers leave the keyboard, the state of the code of each line is right next to the code. So we might write another line. We might stop and get an error. We might stop and get another error. We might add some variables together. We can also do stuff like loops. <laughs> but I want to be clear about this right off the bat. This is not a uh, product pitch or a new project or anything like that. This really is a talk about ideas. And, uh, and to that end, let's step back for a moment and uh, talk about history. So the story of technology is the story of humans struggling to adjust. When new forms of technology enable new forms of media, it takes some time for us to collectively figure out how to use them. Johannes Gutenberg changed the course of history forever with his printing press, but his first major project was to simply make more copies of the Bible, not too much different to the handwritten ones that came before. Fundamentally, new forms of media like newspapers, magazines, comic strips, and uh, the airport novel would uh, come much later, and Gutenberg himself would, of course, be long dead. Before computers, there were slide projectors and overhead projectors. Uh, most of the slides you see in this, in this presentation, uh, or any other at this conference, uh, have slides are not fundamentally different uh, to those slides from yesterday. And back in 1978, before today's MacBook Pros, uh, there was the VT100. It had an 80 by 24 character based terminal. In spite of the fact that there's been a million-fold increase in uh, processing power since then, uh, open up a terminal on uh, your Mac or Linux desktop today, and it'll still probably have 80 by 24 characters by default. But the true promise of computing is not just more and faster replication of existing uh, tools and ideas, but to enable uh, whole new ways of thinking. Steve Jobs famously described a vision of computing as a bicycle for the mind. But programming often seems to fall a little short of that. The constant corrective feedback of a bicycle's lean helps you ride easily, quickly develop an intuitive sense for how the bike moves and responds. Programming, meanwhile, uh, gives you no feedback as you ride a program and unfriendly error messages when you run it. And unless output is specifically incorporated into the program itself, a computer program is a black box producing no output at all. Now, in almost every other creative pursuit, sensory feedback is a given. When you cook, you touch the ingredients, you see the ingredients combine, you smell the food as it cooks, you taste it regularly to tweak the flavors. When you're hammering in a nail, you feel the bounce of the hammer, and you feel the, the you see the uh, straightness or crookedness of the nail. In fact, even other areas of computing have this figured out as well. Take spreadsheets, for instance. Developers have a pretty universal disdain for spreadsheets, but you've got to hand it to spreadsheets. You open it up, you type a number or two, you type a formula, and there you go, you're programming. 
Plus, every cell is right there for you to see. Get a new bike and it's familiar enough that you can just hop on and go. But uh, compare that to the experience of setting up a, a, a new computer as a half decent development environment for any real programming language. Now, some programmers might hand wave away uh, spreadsheets as not real programming. But I think this attitude is mostly a product of bad culture and software. That real programming has to be hard, it has to be, in, it has to be unfriendly, and it has to be inaccessible to outsiders. It's part snobbery and, part, and partly a kind of Stockholm syndrome caused by unfriendly tools. This attitude is probably why half the world still runs on spreadsheets rather than real programming. And what about gaming? You open up a game of Pac-Man, you just start playing, you see stuff happen instantly. There's no tedious upfront configuration, and you don't need to go over to a text editor, write a few lines of instructions for Pac-Man, then go back to the Pac-Man window and run it. That would self-evidently be the worst video game of all time. But this is the status quo of our, uh, our, our tools today in software development. But this is not just a matter of merely making programming a little bit faster or less annoying. This really is a matter of life and death. A 2017 article in The Atlantic discussed the nature of software failure. Software failure isn't like other forms of failure. Most of the time, the software just keeps on running. The reason that it fails is it has been told to do the wrong thing. Software failures, then, are failures of understanding and of imagination. Developers are spending so much cognitive effort, cognitive effort and mental space on just understanding the code itself that things like understanding the requirements, developing an intuitive feel for the problem space, or understanding the system in context takes a much lower priority. I've been a programmer for a good few years now, and it seems wrong on some level to admit this, but I've never felt comfortable with the tools. I want better visualization than just print statements, debuggers, and gripping log files. I'm sick of endless context switching between uh, code files, uh, the terminal, documentation, and uh, stack overflow tabs. To me, programming shouldn't be about text entry. It should be about intuition, visualization, exploration, creation. But for a while, I blamed myself for my own bad attitude. But I was heartened to discover eventually that there were like-minded folks out there pointing out the same problems. Gary Bernhardt, in his 2012 talk, A Whole New World, reimagines a terminal with graphics, code structure, and profiling visualizations built in. But the truly life-changing, eye-opening experience for me was watching Brett Victor's Inventing on Principle talk. It showed a vision of what uh, building software could be like, immersively visual and intuitive, with instant feedback for every single change. In the most famous demonstration from this uh, presentation, Brett adjusts the jumping power of Mario in real time instead of tediously adjusting values in a text editor. The most interesting to me was a different demo where Brett writes code uh, with the output and visualization immediately alongside, much like what you saw at the start. After every single keystroke, the code runs and the state of the program is visualized. An interface like this seemed familiar enough to me in my day-to-day -day programming experience in a text editor to be immediately useful, but different enough to profoundly change the experience of creating and writing software. I wondered how well this would work with Python, and so I built this little prototype that you saw before. And what's different about it is what's not involved. There's no, there's no print statements, there's no log statements, there's no debugger commands, there's no terminal, there's no window switching, there's no context switching. So conceptually, the way this works internally is pretty simple. Um, we run the code through a debugger. Usually a debugger stops at each line and uh, gives you an interactive prompt. To create, to create an interface like this, you simply take the inbuilt Python debugger, uh, you override it so that instead of stopping, it, it tracks the changes in the code and, uh, and carries on. So I thought we'd look at a real code example now. Um, in Inventing on Principle, Brett implements the, the, the uh, classic algorithm of binary search. Uh, so we might as well do the same to see what the Python experience is like. So if you're not already familiar with binary search, you'll be uh, probably familiar with the general idea by looking for a library book on a shelf. 
So instead of starting uh, all the way at the start and going all the way to the end, what you do is you start in the middle of the shelf, you see if the book you're looking for is after or before, and that way you can eliminate half the shelf. You do the same process again, you narrow the search down to one book, and there you've either found your book or, or confirmed that it's not there. So at the moment we've got kind of a shell implementation here, but uh, more, observant, more observant of you will notice that it's not a real binary search. It uses the inbuilt index method, and index is not, it doesn't use binary search, it starts from uh, the start of the list and, and goes all the way to the end. Uh, that doesn't scale very well though, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this code and we're going to replace it with a real binary search. So, like I said, the algorithm starts by finding the halfway point on a shelf. And in our example here, we've got a bookshelf and we have every letter of the alphabet. Just ima imagine it's an old set of encyclopedias or something. Every book has a single letter title, just for simplicity. And so first we need to find the halfway point. And the way we do that is we take the average of the start and the end. So start typing. So the end of the list is the end of the shelf. Now at this point we look over at the output of the program and we see that uh, the end is 26 and the start is 0. And if we're used to Python, we know that uh, Python's 0 indexed. So we'd probably expect that to be um, uh, 0 to 25. And this is something uh, that even if you're uh, very familiar with Python, you might skip over in a, in a hurry. And instead of getting bitten by it later, we can just um, fix it up right now and carry on. So now we've got to figure out our halfway point. So we add the start to the end and we divide it by two. And we immediately notice a problem. Uh, halfway mark is 12.5. Obviously there's no 12.5th book on the shelf. We want a specific book and so we realize we want integer version instead. And again, even if you're experienced, you might have uh, got confused about this because the, uh, the operators changed from Python 2 to Python 3. So again, fix that up. There you go. So now we've got a whole number and that's great. So the next thing to do is look at the book that's at that spot, spot number 12. So make a variable guess and we'll get the halfway point. Okay, and so, we, and so we can see that we've guessed the book M. Now you can see from the bottom that the example we're using, the item that we're looking for is actually G. And so G is obviously before M on the shelf, it's in the first half, and so we need to adjust our start and our end bounds and narrow down the search space to the first half of the shelf. So let's do that. So we'll move the endpoint to uh, before, one before the halfway point. Now we can see that that's been hit correctly. Um, we know that G is, uh, G is before M, before point 12, and we've moved the end to 11. So that seems pretty reasonable. That's reassuring. While we're here, we might as well handle the opposite case. And that means we need to move the start to after the halfway point. And we might also handle the lucky case where we actually come across our book. And um, we could just write an else, but we might as well be explicit about it and write another LF. And at that point, we'd return the halfway point, which was the, the point that we just looked and, uh, and found our found their book. So that's all very well. That's only one iteration of a loop. So um, what we need to do is repeat that process, narrow down the search until we, uh, until we find the book we're looking for. So we'll go up here and uh, like I said before, we're progressively narrowing down the start and end space until we get to the middle. And so we want to stop looking when we've, uh, when we've uh, na narrowed it down to when there's no more empty space to uh, check for books. And so that looks like and it's expecting some indentation. So let's do that. 
and there we go. You can see the flow of the code. First iteration, second iteration, third iteration, fourth. Gets closer and closer in the shelf to it, and eventually we find book G. So that's nice, but let's see if it works for all letters. Seems to work for F, and so on and so on, all the way down to letter A. What about a character that's not in the shelf? That returns none. That's great. OK, so, so far so good. But um, what I can hear you say is, well, that's all very well for uh, simple self-contained functions. But uh, here in my job in the real world, there's external dependencies. There's files, there's databases, there's web servers. But um, luckily, if we're familiar with testing, we're, we're pretty used to uh, faking all sorts of different resources. So um, let's look at an example uh, where we do that to uh, improve the uh, live coding experience. So we're going to use basic web scraping as an example. So let's say there's a uh, picture of my dog on my website, and I want to download it. And so let's do that. So we've already got the URL there. We've already imported the requests library. And so let's download it. And what we've got set up here is that um, anything that uses the requests library um, runs the code through a cache. So the first time we make the request, it might be a little sluggish, might be a little bit slow as it does the download. But as we continue to type, um, it's cached. And so we're not repeating the web traffic. We're not going um, to take down our own server by typing too fast. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess the next thing to do is uh, get the image data out. And so we've got ourselves some image data. Looks like the kind of binary data we might expect. So far, so good. Now, obviously, we want to take a look at the picture. So I guess we need to write some code to like save out the file, um, maybe open it in an image viewer, see what it looks like. Or could just hover over it. OK, so for a final example, uh, we're going to look at instant feedback coding with a real dynamic system. So we've all seen segways around the place, and you always do wonder what makes them stand up straight. How do they do that? Obviously, they need some uh, code hidden in the wheels to make them uh, do the right things. So let's see if we can uh, write the code that could actually make a segway do that. Now, there's a little bit of background here you need to know, so bear with me. Uh, for this exercise, we're going to use uh, what's called a, a PID controller. So these are very common in control systems in uh, all sorts of fields. For instance, your air conditioner might use one uh, to keep the temperature at, at a stable temperature in your house. The way they work is you set a goal number, which for like an air conditioner might be 20 degrees. Uh, for a Segway, we want vertical, so in our case, it will be zero degrees. And so you can see as we set up our controller code, uh, we have, zero, we have uh, zero degrees as the set point. But then what you do is you feed it actual readings, and it'll spit out whatever power level is necessary to uh, keep the system stable. But there's a catch. So uh, PID controllers uh, require tuning. Uh, it gets the name from the fact that there's three basic knobs that you have to uh, tune. Uh, one's called P, one's called I, one's called D. And uh, I should note at this point that I'm no, um, I'm no expert in control engineering. Uh, what we're discussing here is not the best way to design a Segway, but the best way to gain understanding of a system. So what we should do is create a Segway object and uh, connect the controller up. But luckily, when we create a Segway object in our code, we get some visualization. <laughs> and uh, I know these graphics are pretty low effort, but uh, should be pretty good enough for our, they should be good enough for our purposes. Um, I didn't add a body to the crash test dummy. I did add a face, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we'll, we'll connect our controller up to the Segway. So 
sorry. And so, fortunately, still falling over, and this is because uh, we haven't um, we haven't added any input, so no power is getting supplied. But you know, let's start uh, let's start turning these knobs, uh, tweaking some values, and see what happens. Okay, so you can see there's a there's a little white uh, little white arrow there denoting power. Um, so so we've added uh, we've added one of the um, we've moved the setting of the uh, p knob to one, and so p p means proportional, and this means that it'll add power based on how far away from our set point uh, the segue is. So um, 10 degrees off would mean uh, you know, 10 units of power, 20 degrees, 20 units of power, and the more we up this parameter, the, the more powerful the force is. So obviously there's not enough power to really uh, keep the thing level, so let's keep, uh, let's keep turning this up, see what happens. Okay, so that moved the segue a little bit, but obviously still falling over, so. Okay, still not high enough, so let's move it up to 20. Okay, so a little better, but still looks pretty terrifying to get on. <laughs> That's uh, it's wobbling back and forth, so, well, you know, doubling it, doubling it seemed to work well, so let's double it again. 40, okay, still swinging around a bit, maybe a bit higher. Still swinging around. Still doing that. Okay, so it seems like we're turning this up and up and up, but we still can't get rid of this kind of oscillating behavior. So it's kind of overcompensating for the lean. It means it's probably time to move on and tweak one of the other knobs. So this, uh, this I setting, that applies power in, uh, in proportion to the accumulated error. So basically, if, the, if it's been 10 degrees off for, for 10 seconds, that's a certain amount of power. 10 degrees off for 20 seconds, twice as much. So let's see if, let's see if adding a bit of that factor uh, helps, um, helps smooth this out a little. Um, so maybe we'll add 10. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not good. So um, maybe we'll, uh, <laughs> maybe we'll, um, See if a little bit less helps. Okay, no, it's still uh, <laughs> still growing. So, okay, the uh, the integral parameter is not really working out well for us. So we'll chuck that back down to zero, and let's try the third one. So this applies um, this applies power, corrective power, in proportion to the rate of change. And so if it's changing by five degrees a second, a certain amount of power. 10 degrees per second, more power. And so we can, um, we can try tweaking this knob and that might work better than the last one. Hopefully it does. Okay, so a little bit smoother. Let's keep turning it up. Okay, so that's uh, stabilizing um, pretty fast. Looks promising. Okay, so pretty good. It starts off on a lean, starts off falling over, but recovers pretty quick, and it's pretty much staying vertical. But what we're controlling is the angle of the segway, we're not really controlling the position. So the question is, it'd be nice to make it move forward. But if you remember, we can set the set, the set point to anything we want. It doesn't have to be perfectly zero. So we'll add some forward lean. And there we go. He's driving. So the nice thing about all this is how it feels when you're working with it. Doesn't really feel like work or, or drudgery, it just kind of feels like you're goofing around. But on the other hand, it's quite engaging and really uh, helps you build a uh, basic intuition for how the tuning process works. I think, uh, I think what would disappoint me most is if people went away from this talk thinking that this is some kind of training interface uh, suitable for children and learners uh, before graduating to real programming. What I hope to convey is, is that real programming must be like this, instant and visual. Computers aren't, mainstream, uh, computers aren't mainframes for batch processing anymore. They're dynamic systems 
with powerful uh, interactive and visual capabilities. A system truly designed for the spirit of modern computing must take advantage of these capabilities. My hope is that what you've seen here can offer a small glimpse of what programming might look like in an optimistic future. Away from uh, tedious, responseless uh, text editing towards instant feedback. Away from invisible processes towards pervasive visualization. Away from uh, black box coding and towards deep insight. Uh, away from batch processing and towards uh, pervasive visualization. Do you ever stop and think about what programming might look like in 100 years' time? Alan Kay famously said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. The thing is, though, it's not really even about invention, because none of the ideas here in this talk are in any way new. It's about taking time to reflect on what we'd like the future of our craft and our profession to actually look like. To stop hammering in nails for a moment and consider the hammer and realize it's actually a carrot, it's not a hammer. And I'm sure we had a hammer lying around, uh, maybe we should go and use one of those. If we want to build a bridge, maybe we should, start, uh, maybe we should stop uh, chucking rocks in the water and realize that the concept of an arch has been around for quite a while and maybe we should try one of those out. Because the key message of all this is before you can start to build a real bicycle for the mind, first you've got to decide to stop stumbling around in the dark and open your eyes and see. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk, Robert. Please accept this PyCon mug. Thank you. Um, now, Robert is open to questions, so does the audience have any questions for Robert? That was awesome. Um, do, is the code available? Because I really want this as like a code, a VS Code plugin. <laughs> um, I, I, like, I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be possible. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I could release it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I just would like time to, you know, if I was going to release it, I would like time to actually work on it. And, you know, I, I don't have a lot of spare time. But, you know, uh, large corporations, rich people, if anyone would like to, uh, you know, send me, some, send me some money, that would be, uh, <laughs> and uh, let, me, let me work on this uh, a little more, that would be great. Do we have any more questions? All right, thank you so much.